This is what happens when you've spoken at a lot of conferences. You get a little bit afraid when Jonan and Aaron say they're going to introduce you together because you're not quite sure what they're going to say. But I'm Aja. I am Thagomizer most of the places on the internets. I am the Thagomizer on Twitter. I love it when people tweet at me during my talks. And my phone is well over there so you won't distract me. And I have notifications turned off, so this should work well. I work on this Google Cloud platform. And I have to have this slide. And I also really think the cat's cute. So I work on a team at Google that is working to improve our support for Ruby. And as part of that, we've been asking ourselves a lot of questions. Things about how we should interact with the Ruby community, what the Ruby community is doing, what's important to the Ruby community, and making sure that we're using the tools we have correctly. So the questions are things like, what gems are used most often? We want to make sure that we have the appropriate C libraries installed on all of our base Ruby images so that people need specific gems. They just work. We were talking about what test framework we should be writing the test for our examples in. And as that happens in the Ruby community, that turned into a mini test versus R spec debate. So that was another question we needed to answer. Uh, there was a bunch of discussion about whether we needed to support Ruby 1.9. And we're trying to figure out what version of Rails is the most popular right now. And answering these questions was a little bit hard. And I will acknowledge that I guessed for the first six months or so that I was working on this because we're so new at this project that even me guessing wasn't particularly bad. And I guessed that Rails was one of the most popular gems. And I guess that probably more people were still on Ruby 3. And because I'm from Seattle, I guess that Minitest was more popular than RSpec. But we're scientists, and scientists don't guess. Scientists use data. And that's what this talk is about, is how I use data to answer these questions and some others so that we can build the right products for the right people. I use two data sources, the rubygems.org download data. If you go to rubygems.org, there's a tiny data link in the bottom left, and you can see the data that's available. And one of my coworkers, uh, got us a very large data dump from GitHub of all of the public repositories on GitHub. And I also used that data to answer some of these questions. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of the data. RubyGems supplies th two data sets, a Postgres data set and a Redis data set. And I'm only using the Postgres data because the Redis data wasn't useful for answering my questions. The primary table in the Postgres data set is RubyGems. And it lists all the gems. This is what the schema looks like. And I ignored the slug for my purposes because answering my questions didn't require this field. I want to know how popular a gem is, so I need to know how many times it's been downloaded. And the gem downloads table includes that information. Here's the schema. You can see that it's three foreign keys and a count. And so I'm obviously going to need the tables that those foreign keys go to to get any useful information out of this. Or primary key, two foreign keys in account. There's a dependencies table. And that one was not actually particularly interesting for my analysis. Neither was link sets, although if you look at the data, this is the information that includes the documentation link, the GitHub link, the bug tracker link that all appears on a given gems homepage on RubyGems. The versions table, though, is very useful. It is also very big. This is the schema. Uh, I'm going to point out a couple of the fields that I found particularly useful. ID, Ruby gem, and number. Number is the version number, version string. The dates, so that I can figure out trends, figure out what's happening currently in the last six months as opposed to five years ago. And I had some interesting questions about platform licenses. And those two things that are too small for people to read are required Ruby version and required Ruby gems version. The GitHub data has a couple tables that I'm going to use. The first one is files. This is the syntax for this, or schema for this. And this contains all of the files in all public repositories on GitHub. That is a very large set of data. I'm mostly interested in the path and the ID so that I can do joins. Path I'm going to use because I only care about files like gem file, gem file lock, rake file, and .rb files. Contents contains the contents of those files. 
And that field there, content, is the one that contains the raw content of all the files, which includes the entirety of a gem file, entirety of a rake file, and all of the .rb files that are in public repos. Commits, interesting, but not particularly relevant. Languages tracks repo language, so it might be helpful to answer some of our questions. And this is the schema, and that language field is a record. It has nested fields underneath it. And licenses table wasn't particularly interesting either. So I have all this data, but now I need to answer my questions. And the RubyGems download data is actually pretty small. I could have queried it with standard Postgres on my MacBook, not a problem. But the GitHub data set is huge. It is, I believe, 14 terabytes of data. And I'll need to parse the content of all those gem files or gem file locks if I want to figure out what gems people are using in their projects. I don't know how to parse a raw text file and get counts out with Postgres, but I do know how to do it with BigQuery. And I also know that BigQuery can handle a 14 terabyte data set um, easily. So what is BigQuery? It's a non-relational, non-indexed data warehouse tool. It's part of Google Cloud Platform. Why is BigQuery? It was built to search and analyze logs at very, very, very large scale. That's part of why it's non-indexed. And honestly, I don't really know much about how it works. Um, I'm guessing that there's parallel processing and MapReduce involved, but that's just from reading the docs. All I know is that I love BigQuery. I really love BigQuery because it supports standard SQL. I didn't have to learn a new programming language to use it. And there's some tool-specific extensions, but that's true with any database. I love it because it's freakishly fast. Uh, querying that GitHub data set is under a minute, the vast majority of the time. And it scales to handle super large data sets like the GitHub data. And it's complex enough to do things like sliding window analysis, multiple levels of aggregation, and to gracefully handle data that isn't consistently well formed which is something I need because as I found out, some of this data is not particularly well formed. So this is the part where I'm gonna try to do a demo because I can say all these words but you won't believe me until I show you. And we're gonna see. Did the internet come back? It did. So, haha. <laughs> So what I'm doing right here, eh, that's not what I wanted, is I'm querying, I'm querying the repos table to figure out how many repos there are for different languages. So you can see the query running. I'm not using any caching. Uh, 2.1 seconds. Oh, it did use caching. But we can look at the results. When I ran this right before my talk, it took 12 seconds. And we, and we can see the JavaScript is number one. CSS, HTML, shell, Python. Uh, Ruby is seven. So it's actually pretty popular on GitHub. Um, but that queried a fairly large amount of data because it looked at every single repo to figure out what the repo language was. So back to the talk. So to use BigQuery, you need to know some basic vocabulary. The first thing is a data set. This is a group of related tables. If you're used to Postgres or MySQL, just think of it as a database. A table is a bunch of records that are structured in some sort of regular way. That's all you need to know. Have to get the data into BigQuery, and I'm gonna show you two ways of doing that. Um, the GitHub data, someone else took care of this for me, but I had to put the RubyGems data in there. Streaming is pushing records to BigQuery and having them added to your data set in real time. There's a tutorial on our website about streaming records in from FluentD, coming back to the log analysis roots of BigQuery. Uh, you could also use it for clickstream data, or maybe you want to have all of your purchases show up in real time so you can do analysis of them. Those are all good reasons to use streaming. I'm using the Google Cloud gem. Uh, if you've been using our products, this was renamed last week. It used to be the G Cloud gem. Same gem, same code, different name. I'm using the PG gem for Postgres. Here's some initial code I need to have. Requires initializing some environment variables. Creating a BigQuery object, and I am creating a BigQuery data set. Uh, a bit of syntax notes, because I'm dealing with two separate data sources and it got super confusing, everything related to BigQuery 
includes BQ underscore as a, a prefix. Postgres data. And that is me creating the schema for the table in BigQuery. This looks a lot like Rails. Looks a lot like writing a Rails migration, and that is on purpose. The Google Cloud gem is being written by Rubyists for Rubyists by hand, and they're doing what they can to make it easy to use, and having used a lot of different gems from a lot of different large companies, the difference between a hand-coded gem and one that's auto-generated is huge in terms of your ability to get started quickly. I need this columns array of strings uh, because I need to know what columns I'm pulling from the Postgres table. And here's the rest of the code. This is all the code you need. Run a select star on the Postgres table. Iterate through each row. Make a hashed row using the values and that columns array. And then insert it into the BigQuery table. So I had some people do a code review on this, and that first line confused them. So let's take a side trip to that and discuss what Zip and Hash are doing. Say you have two arrays representing the keys and the values that you want to make into a hash. Zip takes elements pairwise and makes an array of pairs. If you didn't understand that, it's okay, I have an animation. So this leaves you with something like this, and now I think you can make it into a hash using the square bracket class method on hash. If I run this, that's what comes out. So all I'm doing here is I'm putting my keys and my values together to make a hash. And I'm doing that because BigQuery expects a hash of values instead of just plain rows so that you can reorder the values if you need to or that values can be missing and it won't mess things up. If you don't want to do something streaming, batch, batch processing is also supported. A couple formats, CSV, JSON, Avro. I always use CSV because I'm almost always pulling out from another data source and exporting to CSV from things like Postgres is pretty easy. Once you have your CSV, you can import. You can do it with code, but I have a rule against automating anything I only do once or twice. So I just do it through the UI. You specify the data source location, where the data should end up. You give it a schema with column names, column types, and whether those columns are nullable. And then you can also specify some options, like how many header rows to skip, how many errors are allowed, if jagged rows are allowed. And all of those options are there because of the roots of BigQuery being in log processing. And log data tends to be messy. And sometimes you want to get most of it in, but you don't care if you have a couple dozen errors where you want to be able to have trailing values on your rows that are optional, and that's where jagged rows come in. I want to make a note here that it takes care of parsing timestamps automatically. You don't have to do anything magic for that. I haven't found a format that Ruby supports that it can't parse. So what now? Uh, we're about a third of the way through the talk, so now we get to actually answer the questions. So the first question was which gem has the most downloads? And we were actually specifically looking for a top 100. Uh, anyone have a guess? Just shout. Active record. Active record, Rails. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Secret is we're all wrong. So here's the query. Really basic SQL. Query took about five seconds to run. And this is the data that comes back from the RubyGems downloads. Uh, so rake, rack, multi-JSON, JSON, and bundler. And I saw that and I was like, of course, of course those would be the ones that are most downloaded. Everyone uses those, even, even non-Rails projects. But then I remembered that the downloads table is actually recording downloads by version. And this is only including one version of each of those gems. So I have to do a group by, I have to do some aggregation. So adding some count and group by name. And query took seven and a half seconds this time but it's the same list as before with slightly bigger numbers after each, after each gem name. So at this point, I'm sitting there talking to the team and we're like, well, how many downloads does Rails have? So let's figure that out. Add a where clause, restricted to gems named Rails, and you get this result back, which is actually pretty high. It's in the top 50 at least. I believe it's actually in the top 20, but it wasn't one of the most top popular 10, which surprised me a lot. So that comes to that second question, in the spirit of Rubyists, Rubyists and our debates over test frameworks, is Minitest or RSpec more popular? 
Everyone can think to themselves for a moment and figure out which one they think is more popular. Here's the query using having. And here's the results. Again, the query took about half of five seconds. Um, Minitest is winning. Uh, we still went with RSpec for some of our examples and Minispec for some others, but it was actually fairly surprising to us that Minitest has more downloads. Next question. Which version of Rails is most popular? I hypothesize that most people were still on three, and I'm going to acknowledge at this point that the data I'm showing is about a month old. So Rails 5 is probably more popular at this point than uh, this data shows. But here's the query, and it's huge and kind of gross because there's two joins. But the cool part is this. This is the part where I am doing a regex to extract the major version using semantic versioning from the version number. I'm getting all of the digits to the left of the first dot. I'm calling that major. And what that gives me back is this. So there's some really big numbers here, and this took, query took about 12 seconds, but it appears that Rails 3 and Rails 4 are about equally popular in terms of downloads. So if you're paying very close attention, like the people at Seattle RB were when I gave this talk there, you'll notice that the numbers don't add up to that large number I showed for the total number of Rails downloads earlier. In fact, I only have about half here. So I spent about an hour earlier this week trying to figure out where the other half of the downloads went. And it turns out that the Ruby gems table, sorry, gem downloads table has a bunch of Rails downloads that are associated with version ID zero. And there's nothing in the versions table with ID zero. So I had to use a left join to pull that data in. And this is an example of a time, here's the rest, of the, that's where the rest of the downloads went to null. Um, this is an example of a time when I assumed the data was well formatted and it wasn't, or that it was completely clean and it wasn't. And I don't know the actual reasons for that, although I'm sure that someone at this conference can tell me, because I think we've got multiple Ruby Gems core committers here. Um, but I believe what happened is a database schema update and some downloads happened before they started tracking versions quite so neatly. So paying attention to detail and actually adding up my values and making sure that they equal to what I thought they should equal was important. So another question we had was, do we need to support Ruby 1.9? And the answer if we're being polite Rubyists is maybe, but we wanted to know for sure. And a good way to answer that question is, let's see what everyone else is doing. So which versions of Ruby do gems released in the past year require? So here I'm using the function date add. I'm taking the current timestamp and I'm subtracting one year from it and I'm getting everything that's been created since then. So that is some backwards logic to do everything in the past year. And here's what I get back. And you can see that most gems in the last year say they'll work on anything greater than or equal to Ruby version zero. I think some people might need to be a little more expl explicit in their gem specs. But the other thing I noticed is that for my purposes of figuring out what versions of Ruby to support, greater than or equal to 2.0.0 and greater than or equal to 2.0 are the same. So I'd like to aggregate those better. Regex be extract again. And that gets me this, uh, which gives us better grouping. I'm gonna ignore that top row of greater than or equal to zero because I don't think that's valid. And I can see that there's, between the different ways of specifying greater than some version of two, uh, there's actually a fair amount there. So we might be able to get away with not supporting 1.9. But we were talking about this in a meeting, and one of the things that we came up to was the fact that downloads don't neatly track against actual usage. When people say, uh, what gems are most commonly used, they, won't, they don't necessarily mean what's most commonly downloaded. If one particular company spins up a lot of servers and downloads all of their gems from Ruby gems over and over again, they could very easily skew the results. So the other thing we thought about doing was looking at the GitHub data for this and to figure out what gems are used most on GitHub. In public repos, that part's important because most people's actual corporate source is not in a public repo. Um, and so the first thing I did is I extracted all the gem file lock files from GitHub. And I did that just by looking at the path and I threw them in another table and that was just to make my queries a little easier to understand. 
uh, and to reduce some joins. And then I wrote this query that is extracting the gem name from the gem file lock and counting it. And it's doing that on every single line of the gem file, which I have split on new line. It's grouping them by the gem name and ordering by total. So there's a lot of SQL there, although less than I showed earlier. But the thing you need to understand is this is parsing every single gem file lock and every single public repo on GitHub that has one. And this query took 14 seconds to run. And these are the results. Uh, I was madly switching my slides from 16.9 to 14, 4 by 3, which is why active support is slightly cut off. But the interesting thing to me is this is a very different list than the downloads data. And there are a number of reasons that could be the case. Uh, there are likely many public repos on GitHub that are Rails projects that have never actually been deployed anywhere. I know I have five. I'm guessing several of you have some as well. Uh, there's also a chance that the, we're getting the dependencies because we're actually looking at gem file lock, which shows the dependency tree. And the nice thing about this is then we had two different top 100 lists, and we were able to rank gems based on their, sh their position on both of those top 100 lists, combine the two, and come up with what we felt was a much better top 100 list that we focused on making sure ran very neatly and installed without any errors on every single Ruby image that we have. So, some conclusions. Um, I learned a few things from this exercise. First of all, I learned that my intuition was wrong and that I shouldn't guess. I should use data as much as possible because I expected Rails or active support to be one of the top five, and it wasn't. Uh, I also le learned that you can't assume that data is well formed even when it comes from a really reliable source that you know is run by very smart people like RubyGems. And I was reminded of how using different data sources can give you different answers to basically the same question. I have a couple extra minutes. I'm not going to show this, but I'm going to also point out that one of the other things we learned from the GitHub data is that Rubyists are the most consistent of every language community in terms of using spaces, not tabs. <laughs> so I work for Google Cloud Platform. Uh, we'll be opening a data center in Japan before the end of the year. Uh, real soon now is my best estimate on when it will open. Um, and I'll be holding office hours in the hall during the afternoon break over in the area by the windows looking over the pond. Uh, one of my colleagues who speaks Japanese will also be there. And we're happy to answer questions, help you debug, talk about your problems, maybe get you some credit if you have an interesting problem. And I'd love for you to hit me up on Twitter if you don't want to miss any sessions or you don't want to go during the break. You can also email me at thagomizer at google.com. And because this is the thing I do, I have a lot of stickers to give away, and you should come say hi. There's some down there on the first table if you don't want to actually talk to me. Uh, and I also have some plastic dinosaurs to give away. Lots of plastic dinosaurs. Uh, so thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. Come on. Usually someone asks, can I have a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys very much. Oh, oh no, no, no. Okay. We got a question. There's a question. Awesome. Too fast. I got one quick little thought, and that is I've always uh, thought of like downloaded gems and ranking popularity is a little odd just because with the tools that have changed over the years and like stuff like continuous integration and whatnot, you have new tools that constantly download and download and download new gems. And I was wondering if your team had any thoughts on how you could maybe think about that, like, I don't know, split it up over time and figure out, see any trends in how maybe our tools have changed how gems are downloaded. I think that's a really good point, and we did talk about it. Um, what we talked about doing was looking at just the versions that have come out in the last year. And the other thing is we normalized against the totals. So we took, we basically looked at the top 100, gave them all rankings, and then added the rankings from that data to the GitHub data. And whoever had the lowest was close enough. And we got our top 100 from there. Um, I don't think ever using 
downloads as my gem is better than your gem is a good idea, although I know a lot of people who really like doing it. But for our purposes of just making sure that we had the appropriate C libraries and that these gems installed cleanly, it was good enough. But you have a very good point about CI and CI massively inflating those statistics. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, we have one here. Oh, uh oh, it's Akira. So, does Google Cloud Platform support Ruby yes. as the first class citizen? Yes. So, does Rails application, does my Rails application work on Google Cloud, Cloud Platform? Yes, and I can talk to you and point you at a blog post of four different ways to run it. Um, one of the things I'm very excited about since I started about a year and a half ago is that we have a team of seven people now in Seattle who are stubborn and passionate and love Ruby, and we've been meeting twice a week, and we're doing our best to make it so that everyone understands within Google and without Google that we care about Ruby and we're going to do it right. And I had a very interesting conversation at a conference a couple weeks ago that someone who uses multiple of our languages is like, how did you guys make Ruby so much easier? And I'm like, we're just better. That's how we did it. So yeah, there's lots of stuff that's working. We've got a lot of people who are actually Rubyists and care a lot about this language, including people who've been on Ruby core working on this now. And I'm really happy with how far we've come. So yes, you can run your Rails application. All right then, do you have any, like, good reason to choose Google Cloud pl Platform over Heroku or something? So it depends on your purposes. It depends on what you want to do. The best story I can tell is that the way we've set stuff up, you can grow with our platform. You can start with something that's like Heroku, a platform as a service. Ours happens to, for Ruby happens to be based on Docker. So when you start moving to a microservices architecture, you start needing to scale parts of your system differently, you can then move to our container offering that allows you to do that and you can do so seamlessly. You don't have to change providers. Um, also, for some people, it ends up being significantly cheaper. I can't guarantee that will be the case for you, but for a lot of people, it ends up being cheaper. Excellent, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for your great talk. And I want to ask, the Ruby Gen data was in Postgres, right? Yes. So have you tried to run the query in Postgres and compare it to the running time with big data, big, big query. So for the Postgres data, they were probably within 20% of each other um, because the data set is only, I think it's a gig and a half. Um, but I couldn't do any of the regex stuff where I was pulling out major versions nearly as easily in Postgres, which is one of the reasons I chose to use BigQuery. But speed-wise, it isn't nearly as impressive on that data set as it is on the GitHub data set. So. Thank you. Any more? Oh, I one more. more. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. I found that uh, you 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 said that uh, uh, how popular the which version of the Rails is through the download times, and but uh, for example, me myself, I've upgraded from Rails three to Rails four then Rails five, but I I contribute more downloads for R Rails three, but actually my 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 project has already upgraded to Rails five. How how can you deal with those problems? It's hard. And one of the things I plan to do is to actually look at the versions of the gems from the gem file lock. I only pulled the names out with the regex. And also possibly to look and see what GitHub projects have been updated recently. That said, I know a lot of very large companies that are still on Rails 3. Um, and I know a number of people who've come to talk to us about using our platform are still on Rails 3. And I encourage them to move to Rails 4 or hopefully 5. But we need to make sure that we support whatever they're on right now. So, but yeah, there is, there is a flaw yeah. in my logic there. You're totally right. Thanks. Uh, I think we're out of time for questions. If you have any questions, please meet Aja for lunch or contact her in any of the various ways that she presented in her slides. So thank you very much, Aja.